we'll start by talking about the two atrioventricular valves, and then we'll go through the semilunar valves in detail. <coughs> Again, this, bless you, this should all kind of be reviewed from lab. So the term atrioventricular kind of gives you a clue um, as to where these AV valves are. Remember when we look at the heart, we have atria on top, and then we have these ventricles. Gosh. These ventricles on the bottom, and they're connected, right? Like the blood goes from the atrium down to the ventricle, from the atrium down to the ventricle. So obviously there's a hole here, there's a connection between the two chambers. Now we guard that connection with the valve because again, we want the blood to go from the atria down to the ventricle, we don't want it to go backwards. So there's a valve right here that protects that opening and another AV valve right here that protects that opening. Okay. Um, they're just made of these little folds of fibrous tissue that extend from like the endocardium. So the endocardium, the layer comes up here, then we have this strong fold of fibrous tissue that'll fold in, and on this side, there's another one that folds in. So we have these little flaps that hang down into this hole. There's actually three on this side. Um, now, when we look at the right AV valve and the left AV valve, we do see that they have some slight structural differences. The one on the right, remember, we called the tricuspid valve. Why? Three folds, right? Or three cusps or three flaps of tissue that go down into that hole. Tri meaning three. On the left side over here, it's called the bicuspid valve. How many folds do you think it has? Two, Two right? A tricycle has three wheels because tri means three. A bicycle has two wheels, bi means two. Um, the bicuspid valve, what else do we call that? Mitral. mitral. We call this on the left side the mitral valve. Now again, these valves allow the blood to flow only in the correct direction. So they allow the blood to flow from where to where? From the atria to the ventricles. Okay, and what I mean by that is from the right atrium to the right ventricle. From the left atrium to the left ventricle. Okay, they do not allow it to flow backwards. Now, when we look at these, if the valves just existed like this, with nothing else attached to them, they would be absolutely useless, okay? Because right now, um, all they are are these flaps of tissue that hang down into a hole just like this, okay? Just flaps. So if they were just like that, when the ventricle contracts and produces a bunch of force, that force would just blow the flaps up like that. And again, I always tell you guys, it's like saloon doors, right? You know how saloon doors just swing back and forth? That's what these flaps would do. So we need to secure them in some way. So we have a couple associated structures. We have chordae, tendinae, and capillary muscles. And together, what these things do is they grab onto the free end of these flaps and secure it to the heart wall. So now we have the flaps that are like this. They'll allow the blood to flow down from the atria to the ventricle. And then when the ventricle contracts and the flaps start to push up, they go like that. And they're secure. The strings are holding on to them and attached them to the heart wall, so they go right up into the hole like that, and they per they create this perfect little seal. Okay, so when we look at these papillary muscles and chordae tendinae, um, chordae tendinae, this literally means tendinous cord. It's like a rope. You'll see a little rope that attaches onto that tissue and then goes towards the heart wall. Right at the heart wall where the chordae tendinae attach, you'll see a bulge of muscle. That bulge of muscle is called a papillary muscle. Okay, and that holds onto those cords and tenses really hard so that the cords hold onto the tissue and it doesn't blow out the other direction. Okay, so here we can kind of see the way that the atrioventricular valves work. Um, this actually looks like the left AV valve because it's a bicuspid, but I just want you to get the point of like, what's happening here and the way that the valve works. Again, the AV valves are located between an atrium 
and a ventricle. Right, so the right atrium, right ventricle, or left atrium, left ventricle. So there's atrium up here, ventricle down there. Okay, same thing, atrium up here, ventricle down here. The blood should go down, right, here's the direction of blood flow. The blood should go from the atrium down to the ventricle, right? So this ventricle is relaxed. It's filling up with blood. This valve is open, right? The AV valve is open and the blood's flowing down. Now here, when this ventricle starts to contract to pump blood out, there's pressure, right? And it starts to push up on that valve. We don't want the blood to go backwards. That decreases the efficiency of your heart. So this valve snaps shut. And you can see that happening, right? It looks kind of like a parachute. Um, the blood will push up on these and they'll just go straight up into that hole and seal that, that, that opening between the atrium and the, and the ventricle. Here you can see these chordae tendinae, all these strings that attach. And then down here, this bulge is the papillary muscle, right, where we kind of anchor on. Here you can see it again, the cords, the chordae tendinae. And then the papillary muscles are those bulges where we secure them. Um, and the next lecture, we'll see that the closing of this valve is what produces the first sound in your heartbeat. Okay, and when this valve snaps shut, it actually produces a sound that we can hear um, with the stethoscope. You can feel it. So those are the AV valves. The semilunar valves will prevent the backflow of blood from a large vessel back into the ventricles. Remember the ventricles are pumping chambers. Right? They contract and that forces blood out of the heart to get in the artery. Well, then when the ventricle relaxes, there's no pressure pushing forward anymore, right? And the blood tries to drop backwards. We don't want the blood to go backwards. So we have one-way valves at the bottom of those arteries that snap shut so the blood does not go backwards into the corresponding ventricle. Um, <clears throat> when we look at semilunar valves, semilunar really, literally means like partial moon, right? Luna is moon. Um, and these look like three little like partial moons that come together. They're like cups almost, like tiny little cups. And um, as the blood goes out, the cups are like open, but as the blood tries to flow backwards, it literally starts to fill them up and they snap shut as they fill up. We do not have any associated structures with them. There's no chordae tendinae, there's no papillary muscles. Um, and the reason for that is that they don't have to be super strong. Um, these are just holding up to the pressure that's in the arteries. So that pressure is way lower than the actual ventricle contracting, um, and they just don't have to be super strong. The AV valves have to be incredibly strong because those ventricles are contracting hard. So they need those associated structures to help stabilize them. When we look at the semilunar valves, the semilunar valves include the pulmonary and the aortic semilunar valves. Okay, they're named very easily for the arteries that they lead out of. Um, again, when we look at the heart, there's atria, down here we've got the ventricles. The right ventricle pumps out to the lungs, right? And what vessel does it go through? The pulmonary trunk, right, to go to the lungs. So at the base of the pulmonary trunk, we'll have a semilunar valve called the pulmonary semilunar valve or the pulmonic valve. That stops the backflow of blood from the pulmonary trunk into the right, right ventricle. So the right ventricle contracts, the blood gets pumped out this way, the valve opens, that's fine. But then when the ventricle relaxes again, there's no force moving forward and the blood tries to drop down, the valve snaps shut so that it can't go backwards. Remember the left ventricle pumps blood all the way out to the body via what vessel? The aorta. So at the base of the aorta, we have the aortic semilunar valve. Again, the ventricle contracts, the valve pops open, we eject blood. When the ventricle relaxes and the blood tries to drop backwards, it snaps this shut. So the blood does not flow backwards into the left ventricle. As far as when they're open, when they're shut, we're gonna talk through this whole process a lot. Um, so don't worry, I just kind of been like throwing it out there for you right now, but we'll go through the whole process quite a few times. So if it's too fast right now, don't worry. Essentially the stuff that's in bold on here is the stuff I want you to catch right now. So this is just kind of 
have shown you the way that the semi-linear valves work. Um, here you can see the way that they're kind of like little cups and they're shaped kind of like moons. This is showing you the top view. So this is like if we were in the vessel looking down at it. So the ventricle will be on the other side of it. This is the vessel side of it. Um, <clears throat> again, they're at the base of these, these large vessels that lead out of the ventricles. So the right ventricle goes to the pulmonary trunk the left ventricle goes to the aorta. At the base, we'll have these valves, right, right there, and right here. They allow blood to flow out like it's supposed to. Okay, so the ventricles contract, and you can see this blood, how it pushes these cusps open, and the blood can be ejected from the ventricle. So that's an open semilunar valve. But then when the ventricle relaxes and the blood tries to drop down backwards again, it fills up these cusps, right? So if this blood tries to drop down, it's gonna force that cup shut like that. <coughs> and that shuts the semilunar valves so that the blood cannot go backwards into the ventricles. I have some good videos, but I just don't have time right now, so I'll post the, um, the links to them like how the heart works animated type videos. Okay, so we're gonna kind of take a second to put everything we've learned together, or a lot of what we've learned together. We'll add a little bit as we go, um, but we're just gonna kind of talk through blood flow from where it first enters the heart and follow the blood all the way through the heart going over like a few key details um, as we progress through. So we start at the right atrium. Right here, these markers all fall. All right, so my atria, my ventricles, right? Right atrium, what's this one? What's this one? What's this one? So blood, is, we're gonna start right here with the blood coming into the right atrium. And the blood is gonna come into the right atrium via numerous different vessels that we kind of talked about in lab. Um, real quick, remember when we sliced this heart, we see muscular ridges present in both the atrium and the ventricles, but we name them differently, right? The muscular ridges that are present in the atria are called pectinate muscles. What do we call them in the ventricles? Carnate, trabeculae carnate, okay? Down in the ventricles, the ridges are trabeculae carnate. So in this atria, we're gonna see, or in this right atrium, we're gonna see pectinate muscles, lots of muscular ridges present in there. And we're gonna see that the right atrium receives deoxygenated blood. What does that mean? Without oxygen. Okay, we've already given the oxygen to our tissues. This is the blood that, that's lacking in oxygen. It's going to receive that deoxygenated blood from systemic circulation. So essentially that means from what? The body. Okay. The blood is going to come in through the superior vena cava up top. That's a huge vessel up top here. The superior vena cava essentially is going to collect blood from here up. So like the top part of your chest, your arms, and your head. All that deoxygenated blood comes up and goes into the right atrium from the superior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is down at the bottom of the right atrium. And remember that's the one that actually comes all the way down to like here. And you'll see this huge vessel that goes down through the diaphragm all the way down to your belly button and then it splits. So the inferior vena cava is gonna collect from your abdomen, from all the organs or viscera that are present there, all the membranes that are coating um, the abdominal organs, the pelvic organs, the legs. All of that's gonna come up and in through this inferior vena cava, right here, so inferior vena cava, and into the right atrium. Finally, along the very back of the heart, we have the coronary sinus. Um, that collects all the blood from coronary circulation. Remember, coronary circulation are the blood vessels that deliver blood to the heart itself, because the heart's a strong muscle that's working, so it has its own little blood supply. All that deoxygenated blood from the heart itself ends up getting you know, pulled back around to the back of the heart and into this little sac called the coronary sinus. And then that's gonna empty into the right atrium. Okay, so the right atrium is in the top right. 
it's getting deoxy blood from these key um, vessels. Here we see our right atrium up here. And what kind of blood is it getting? Deoxy. Is it coming from pulmonary circulation or systemic? Systemic. systemic. Good. Um, from the top of the body, it's coming in through what vessel? Superior vena cava. Superior vena cava. From the bottom of the body, it's coming up through what vessel? Inferior, Inferior vena cava. From coronary circulation, it comes around the back and it dumps in, um, like right here, via what? Coronary sinus. Good job. What are the muscular ridges called in the atria? Pectinate muscles. Good. So from the right atrium, blood is going to drop down into what? The right ventricle. Okay, this happens about 70% passively without the atria contracting at all. About 70% just flows down. The atria just contracts to get that last little bit of blood down into the ventricles. Okay, so this is mostly a passive process that the blood is going from the right atrium down into the right ventricle. As it goes from the atria to the ventricle, what does it pass through? The right AV valve. What did we call that one? Tricuspid. Okay, there's three cusps on the right side. Here we go again, we're talking about this valve. Um, the tricuspid valve is gonna be open when the ventricle is relaxed. So it can fill with blood. Right, because when the ventricle is relaxed and open, it's filling with blood. The blood should be able to drop down from the atrium and into the ventricle, so that valve should be open. However, when the ventricle contracts to eject blood, what happens to that tricuspid valve? Closes, right? So the tricuspid valve closes when the ventricle contracts, and why? What do we want to prevent? To prevent backflow into where? into the right atrium. And again, when these AV valves close, that's our first heart sound. We'll talk about the sounds later though. Um, <clears throat> when we look at the ventricles, again, we have muscular ridges that are present in the ventricles, just like we had in the atria. Those ridges were called pectinate muscles in the atria. What are those ridges called in the ventricles? Trabeculae carnae. Now, we have a very special muscular ridge that's present called the moderator band. And what the moderator band does is it goes over from the septum and travels over to the papillary muscles. And this moderator band, so it's like, so like if that's my ventricle, that's my septum. Um, the moderator band comes from the septum and it's a special muscular ridge that goes over like that and it'll attach to the papillary muscles. So what this moderator band does is it carries the electrical signal that stimulates contraction from the septum over these papillary muscles. And it's like a shortcut, okay? Because as we follow the, the, the signal that tells the heart to contract, what we'll see happening is that the signal will come down the septum, it'll go around the bottom, and then we'll tell the heart to contract. And then the ventricles will squeeze. So what this does is it's a little shortcut that tells the papillary muscles, hey, we're about to contract, you should start to hold this valve strong. So the papillary muscles get that signal first, they contract and they're holding onto the valve, and then a few milliseconds later, the heart contracts and the ventricles squeeze. Okay, so again, it's just like a little electrical shortcut that tells those papillary muscles that they need to start holding strong because the ventricles are about to contract. Um, and it's one of those ridges, one of the trabeculae carnae. This is just showing you those valves in the chordae tendineae and papillary muscles. What we're looking at is we're in a ventricle um, and the light is shining from the atrium. So you can kind of see like some of these ridges that are present in the ventricle. Up here would be the flaps. This is showing you um, a nice example of papillary muscles and then all of these chordae tendineae that are attached. And again, they're strong. You guys will see when we dissect today, they're, they're really strong.